Good morning, everybody. Well, full house this morning. It's lovely just to still see people coming in. I'm not encouraging the this to be together this morning. Um, as you'll have heard on the news this week, for the next two Sundays, we won't be allowed to gather together. But we are here this morning. And although we might be disappointed that we can't be here next week and the week after, we are here today. And we're here today to meet with each other and to worship God. And so this morning, let's not kind of think how we're not going to be here next week, but instead let's live in the moment this morning and worship our God together. One of the things that we're going to do this morning is celebrate the Lord's Supper. And my hope is that as we do that, that we are nourished and encouraged to live for Jesus in these next two weeks when we can't meet. Also, can I just encourage you, in the next couple of weeks, do check online, keep online with the website. We've got a latest news section on there and an online section. And our website is ravenhillchurch.org. And if you've not been on it, you'll find it if you Google it. But please do check the website because all the information that you're going to need to keep in touch over these next couple of weeks is going to be there. But this morning we are here and we're here to worship. Let me read an invitation from God. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we get an insight into heaven. And it says this, Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This morning we're here to worship the Holy One, the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. Let's pray together before we sing his praises. <laughs> Almighty and everlasting God, we are disappointed this morning that for the next two Sundays we're not going to be able to gather here as your people to worship you. But we are here this morning, Lord. And we're here to worship you. We're here to give you our praise and our thanks and to declare to you just how great we think you are. Lord, our prayer this morning is that as we gather in this place, that you would meet with us afresh and that you would encourage us. Almighty God, we're here this morning because we want to reflect again on your greatness, on your otherness, on your righteousness and your purity and your holiness. Oh, holy God, would you meet us afresh this morning and encourage us and nourish us in our faith. Lord, this morning we're here, we want to praise you again for your faithfulness. We want to praise you for your goodness to us, for your kindness, for the forgiveness that is ours because of Jesus. Lord, we pray this morning that as we gather here in this place, that you would meet us afresh and encourage us in our faith. Almighty God, we're here this morning because we want to sing your praises because you are glorious. We want to hear your word because you have things to say to us. And we're here this morning to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to take the bread and to take the wine and be nourished and sustained in our faith through that. Oh Lord, this morning we pray that you would grant us a very real sense of your presence. We pray this morning that you would meet with us in a very real way and encourage us and teach us how to live holy lives lives that please you. <clears throat> Lord, we confess this morning that in this past week, even though we've wanted to live holy lives, so often we have failed. We confess, Lord, that this week that the good that we wanted to do, we failed to do. And the things that we didn't want to do, we ended up doing anyway. Lord, as we confess our sin to you this morning, we also, with eyes of faith, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on Calvary and rose again, the one who took our sin on himself so that we could be forgiven and declared holy in your sight. Oh Lord, this morning we declare that all of our hope is in Jesus. Almighty God, we are here in this place today and we are here to meet with you and to worship you. And we thank you that as we come here to this place, that you come and are with us by your spirit. Encourage us and strengthen us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and reflect on God's holiness as we say, holy, 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 Lord God.
called Be Holy. And it's a series encouraging us to live holy lives. So the first week in the series, we saw that God calls us as followers of Jesus to live holy lives. And then last week, we looked at the person of Jesus. And we saw what counterfeit holiness looks like. And then we saw what real holiness looks like. And we saw how beautiful it was. And this week, what we're going to look at are some of the keys, some of the keys that we need to have in our minds when it comes to living a holy life. Let me read from God's Word. So I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 3, and then I'm going to read a couple of verses from Romans chapter 7. And these words will be on the screen, and I'd encourage you to follow along. This is the Word of God. Paul writes this to the church in Colossae, and also to us. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any one of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And now I'm going to read some of other Paul's words to another church in the city of Rome. So this is the same person who's called churches to live holy lives, who's called us as Christians to follow Jesus. Then this same person also writes these words, which we're going to see this morning should be huge encouragement to us. Paul writes this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Let's pray this morning as we come to consider the keys to living a holy life. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the God who speaks. And you speak through your word when it is read, and you speak through your word whenever it is preached. Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would speak to us. Father, we pray that the things that are of you, the things that you want us to, to cling to and remember, we pray that they would stick with us. And Lord, we pray that anything unhelpful would just blow away like chaff. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Um, I started playing golf about six years ago. And whenever I first started playing golf, I hit all of the clubs really badly. In fact, it was pretty embarrassing. And um, one day I was teeing off at the first tee box at Bangor Golf Club and I managed to put it in the car park, which is literally beside the tee box. None of the clubs I could hit well. But over time I started to get a little bit better and I could hit some of the clubs straight and that was really good. But there was one club that I could just not get a handle on at all. The big, chunky driver. I just couldn't do it. Every time I hit the driver, I either hit it about four feet in front of me or I hit it left or right. I could not hit the thing. 
In fact, the guys that I used to play with, and we would get to a certain hole, it was the 15th hole, and it would go around a corner, and it was a building site on the other side, and every time I went to tee off, they'd say to me, I hope the lads have their hard hats on this morning. It was terrible. But you know what? It was the one club I wanted to hit. The one club I wanted to hit straight and far, and I just could not do it. Until that is, someone gave me a few key insights. They told me, Marty, whenever you hit the big chunky one, it's not like hitting all the other clubs. There's a, a way to do it. You need to do a few things to, to hit it well. You need to, to widen your stance a bit more than you normally do. You need to plant your feet. You need to, to lean forward at the balls of your feet. And put the ball at the front, your front foot, and then just swing through it gently. Now, it didn't come immediately. But you see, taking those few key things that this guy said, suddenly I can hit my driver and it's not embarrassing anymore. Now it's really interesting, isn't it? Whenever it comes to living a holy life, it's a bit like hitting the driver. We really want to do it, don't we? I mean, I hope that, that the past couple of weeks as you've left the church and gone home, I hope that you've gone home thinking, you know what, I do want to live a holy life. I want to have this life of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. I want to be someone who obeys God and lives God's way. My hope is that every Sunday, whenever you left here the past couple of weeks, you've gone home thinking, yes, this is what I want to do. <laughs> but then we made up on Monday morning, don't we? And it's hard. And, and as we live out our week, we wonder how do we actually go about living a holy life? Well, this morning what I want to do is I want to, to highlight a few keys that we get on living a holy life. And we get these keys from the Bible, from the New Testament. And my hope this morning is that this week as we look at these keys, and next week online as we think about the fight for holiness, that you're given some tools that you need to live a holy life. So this morning there are four keys. I'm going to spend most of our time on the first key, so don't panic. You know, if you're spending an awful lot of time on point one, and there's three more points to come, don't panic. We will get to communion. We will all get out of here. But let me give you four keys this morning. And the first key is this. Whenever we think about living a holy life, we should think about living a holy life as being a journey we take rather than a destination we get to. We need to think about it as being a journey we take rather than a destination we get to. You know I have two young boys and uh, without fail, if we're going on a journey, as soon as we pull out of the driveway, like, and I mean like as soon, just out of the driveway, I mean we just reversed out of the driveway, we literally can see the house here, we're just out of the driveway, and without feel, you know what they say, don't we? Are we there yet? And, and, and that's like, it's just, it's just crazy to me, it's like, that, like, no, of course we're not there, we just left. But without feel, that's the first question they ask. Are we there yet? And then what's even more mind-boggling as a dad is that whenever I say to them, no guys, we're not there, we just left, they're frustrated and disappointed. Oh, why aren't we there yet? It's so weird. But yet as Christians, <laughs> this is how we are when it comes to holiness, isn't it? I think we expect to be there. Some of us have been Christians for Years. Some of us have been Christians for decades. And yet whenever we look at our lives, we think, you know what, I'm not perfectly holy yet. And we get frustrated and, and disappointed with ourselves. Maybe we look at other people who are ahead of us on the journey. Great men and women of the faith who, who are ahead of us. And we, and we look at their lives and then we look at our lives and we're frustrated and we're disappointed that we're not where they are. Why is that? It's because I think in all of our minds, we do expect at some point that this, we're going to reach a point of being perfectly holy. I think all of us at some point think that we're going to reach the destination. And many of us think we should be there already. But that isn't the picture of holiness we get in the Bible. The Bible does say that one day we will be perfectly holy. And that day is whenever we see Jesus face to face. When we see him, then we'll be like him. But until we see him, 
we must recognize that holiness is a journey we take and not a destination we arrive to this side of eternity. And I love it, it's the Apostle Paul who really encourages me in this. You know, whenever we think of Jesus, I mean, he was perfect. He was the only one who was perfectly holy. But everyone else in the Bible that we look at, they weren't. They were all on the journey, and that includes the Apostle Paul. I love what he says in Romans chapter 7. I read it a few moments ago, and I love it because I resonate with it so much. I don't understand what I do. Listen, church in Rome, I'm the Apostle Paul, and listen, I just don't understand how it is with me. I don't understand why this happens. Let me tell you what happens to me. He says, what I want to do, I don't do it. I want to live a holy life. I want to be perfectly holy. And I don't do it. I want to always say the right thing, and I don't. I want to always react the right way, and I don't. I want to be always loving the people, and I'm not. Listen, little church in Rome. You're on your journey to holiness, but so am I. The things I want to do, I don't. In fact, Blickman says next, but what I hate, I do. I even do the things I hate. I do things that I'm ashamed of. I do things that I know aren't pleasing to God. And then he goes on, he says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Do you see that? I keep on doing. You see, holiness for Jesus, it was happening, it happened, it was instant. He was the holy one, the only one who was holy all of the time. But for men like the Apostle Paul, for mums like you, for dads like me, for younger people like you, for older people like you, for men, for women, for everyone else. The pursuit of holiness is a journey. A journey which we will only get to the end of when we get to heaven and are in the presence of God. This morning, I really hope that I encourages you. Because it is so easy to beat ourselves up at not being there yet. But we're never going to be there. And I want you to know that this morning. We might be making progress. We should be making progress. But please, 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 don't get to the point in your life whenever you're disappointed and frustrated that you're not perfectly holy. It's not going to happen this side of eternity. I don't know if you have a favorite TV show, but one of my favorite shows, it's on BBC iPlayer if you want to check it out, and I would recommend it. It's called Race Across the World, and you're never going to guess what it's about. Yeah, it's about a race across the world. And it's, it's a brilliant program, so you have these teams of two, and they all set off from one place. So they set off from London, and they go to race to Singapore, and they've got all of these destinations to meet on the way. But the thing that makes the show really interesting is that they're not allowed to use aeroplanes. And they've only got about 700 quid each. And it's a fantastic program because whenever you watch it, you see this journey and it's just incredible to watch. Times of real highs and times of real lows. Times when they're moving so quickly through a country and times when it's taken so long you wouldn't believe. Times whenever they're delayed and times when they're actually going back on themselves. But yet all of the time, they're making progress. It might be slow, it might be difficult, it might be fast, it might be quick and easy, but the whole time they're making progress. And folks, what I want to encourage you with this morning is that, that this called a holy life, it's a journey, and our call is to go in the right direction. The call is to keep progressing, to keep taking step after step after step, and to keep going, pursuing holiness. There's a man called John Newton, and you will know his most famous hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see. John Newton, he was a slave trader. He traded in slaves. And then he came to see Christ, and his life was transformed. And he ended up becoming a Church of England minister. And a very good one at that, making a real impact. 
But John Newton, he understood that holiness was a journey. And he wrote this. And I think if there is one thing to take away from this morning about the journey of holiness, it's this book because it encapsulates what the pursuit of holiness is. That it's a journey and not a destination. He writes this. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope in another world to be. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Maybe you sit here this morning and you're frustrated that you're not at the destination. Maybe you sit here this morning and you're frustrated that you're not holier than you wish you were. But friend, I want you to do something. Think back 10 years. Think back to your life 10 years ago. Think back to the way life was. Think about your thought life. Think about your habits. Think about your behavior. Think about how you lived. Have you made progress? Because I'm sure you have. I'm sure like John Newton, you can say, I'm not who I once was. And the good news is that as you pursue holiness, you'll be changed as you make step after step after step. Every year people take a trip from London to Istanbul. And do you know how they get there? They go on the train, the Orient Express. I don't know if you've ever been on it. I'd love to go on it. And it's amazing on the Orient Express because they're not there for the destination, they're there for the journey. And as they sit on that train, they look back at all the sights they have seen. And they remember those sights and they enjoy the things that they've seen, but they also sit on that train looking forward to what's ahead. Folks, holiness is a journey. And what I want to say is look back and rejoice in the ways that God has changed you. But don't be discouraged in the present. Because in the future, on the journey ahead, he's going to change you more. To become like his son, Jesus Christ. Folks, this morning I want you to get this. Holiness is a journey. And our responsibility is to take steps towards holiness. And the second thing then that we have to recognize this morning, and this is also really important, is that we have a responsibility to become holy. We have a role to play whenever it comes to becoming holy people. Um, I don't know if you've noticed. Have a look at me closely. Look, look at my face. Notice anything different? It's a wee bit chubbier. My face is a little bit chubbier than it was maybe five or six weeks ago. And the reason why my face is a little bit chubbier than it was five or six weeks ago is because I've been on a little bit of weight. Now, I'm not worried about it, don't worry, I'm not you know, worried about it, but I have put on weight. And it is noticeable to me, um, can even feel it on my hips a wee bit, don't really like it. But anyway, I put on weight. And, and one of the things that I really, really would like is to lose a little bit of weight, just a few pounds. This is my face goes back to being not as chubby as it was, or as it is right now. I really would like to lose a few pounds. Um, but honestly, if you analyse my life just now, I'm just kind of hoping it's going to happen. If you analyse how I'm living, you will see that I'm just hoping to wake up one day and these few pounds be shed. Because I'm not eating less calories. And I'm not burning any more calories. I'm not eating healthier. And I'm not doing any more exercise. You see, if I want to lose these couple pounds, I need to either take in less calories or burn more. But if you looked at my life, what I'm really hoping is that I'll just wake up one morning and the pounds will be gone. Now, is that not the way it is when it comes to holiness sometimes? I mean, we, we want to live a holy life. We want to please God. We want to be those people who love others and are full of joy and peace and patience and kindness. We, we want to rid ourselves of sin. And what do we do to, to, to kind of pursue that? Well, we go to bed at night and we wake up in the morning, we stand on the holy scales and hope that some of our sin has fallen away and some of our goodness has arrived. 
We don't really do much to cultivate holiness in our lives. But the reality is that if we're going to grow in holiness, then we do actually need to make steps, take steps, put in effort to become holy people. A Canadian author, a Canadian Christian author, he puts it this way. He says, people do not drift towards holiness. Apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate towards godliness. If we're going to become holy, if we're going to make progress, we have a part to play in that journey. But here's the question. I mean, what exactly are we meant to do? Never thought about that. I mean, when it comes to losing weight, I know what I need to do. Eat less or exercise more. It's dead simple. But what do we actually need to do to progress in holiness? Well, do you know what? It isn't actually that difficult. I mean, that's not saying it's not difficult to do. It is just like losing weight is. But it's not difficult to understand what we have to do. And there are two things that we have to do. And we see it in our passage in Colossians chapter 3. The first thing that we see we're to do is that we are to be people who kill sin in our lives. Look at what Paul says. He says, put to death, put to death, kill, strangle, whatever we need to do to kill it, this is what we need to do. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Listen, church in Colossae, if you want to kind of grow in holiness, if you want to become more holy people, then what you need to do is put sin to death in your life. You need to be killing the sin that's threatening to kill your relationship with God. You need to be making steps to strangle sin, to squeeze it out, to kill it, to squeeze the life out of it so that it doesn't have power of me anymore or isn't in your life. Put sin to death, Paul says. And folks, this is what we're called to do. Do you remember what we said about holiness the first week? We said that holiness was connected with God's moral purity. In God there is no sin. Perfectly sinless. And holiness involves getting rid of sin in our lives. Let me ask you a question this morning. And this is an important one, so please do listen. The question is this. What is the biggest sin that you're struggling with just now? What is the biggest sin that has a real grip on you just now? What is the sin that is always able to make you feel guilty? What is the sin in your life just now that is always able to make you feel ashamed if it speaks to you and reminds you that you're doing it? What is the sin in your life just now that makes you question whether you really are a Christian or whether God can even accept you even though you know you trust Jesus? What is the big sin in your life just now that is really causing you difficulty? You see, whatever that sin is, folks, that is the sin this morning that I want to encourage you to kill to fight, to battle, to put to death. Because you see, that sin, whatever that particular sin is for you, that sin is like the leader of a gang. And once that sin has been killed, the rest of the gang will be easy to defeat. Or maybe not easy, but easier. It's like a domino, that sin. It's like a domino, and once you kill it, the others will fall so much easier. This morning, I want you to realize that your job, your call, is to fight sin in your life. And 
to kill it. And that language, it is strong language. Killing is a, a language of a fight. I mean, if I tried to put you to death this morning, which I won't, because I'm a Christian, and I love you, but if I was going to try to put you to death this morning, you'd fight against me, wouldn't you? You'd put up a fight with all of your might. You'd try to injure me and fight back. This is what it's like to fight sin. It's hard, it's difficult, it's not easy. But Paul says this morning, to progress in holiness, it involves killing sin in your life. I can't tell you what you need to do to kill the sin in your life. Some of you maybe just need to starve it to death, just neglect it, just leave it until it dies. Some of you, you might need to, to do something radical and drastic to kill it. But whatever it is this morning, whatever that big sin is in your life, go to war with it tomorrow morning. Fight against it. Don't stop until it is dead. And then go on from there and start to kill the other sins that you become convicted of. A second thing then that Paul says we're to do, it's not just that we kill sin, but the second thing we're to do to go to holiness is to also make holy choices in our day-to-day -day lives. The second thing we're to do as we live in our life to, to become more holy people, to, to pursue holiness, is to make the holy choice. Look what Paul says in Colossians. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And every day, we have a choice to make, don't we, of what we wear. We, we go to our wardrobe, and we have a look at whatever clothes we've got, and in each day, we have a choice to make what we wear. And we take out those clothes, and we wear them, we, we have that choice, and we make it. And what Paul says here, he says, listen, to live a holy life, to pursue holiness, what I want you to do is, I want you to clothe yourselves with holy things. Patience, kindness, compassion, goodness, gentleness. Little church in Colossae, in your everyday life, make a choice that's holy. Let me try and put some flesh on this. Are we not all in positions every day where, where we have a choice to make? We're talking to someone and they've said something to us which has rubbed us up the wrong way. And in that moment we have a choice, don't we? Are we going to rip them to shreds? Are we going to be rude and mean to the back? Or are we going to choose to be gracious and kind in our words? Every day we have choices to make people hurt us and say things to us that, that wrong us and we have a choice to make. Will we get our own back with revenge? Or will we forgive them? I mean, am I the only one who at times knows that I have a choice to make? And it's like the two that will kind of think through my shoulder, the devil and the angel, and, and I, I can see the choice which is sinful so clearly, and I can also see the choice which is good. Does that resonate with you? What Paul says to, to grow in holiness, one of the things that we're to do is to make the godly, holy choice. To choose what's good and right and glorious and pleasing to God. Again, it's not easy. But these are two things that if we can do in our day in and day out of life, if we can fight sin and start to kill it, and if we can make holy good choices, then we will grow as holy people. But this is hard to do. This is really, really hard to do, which brings us to the third key of living a holy life. And the third key to living a holy life is to recognize that the Holy Spirit will give us the power to do it. The Holy Spirit will give us power to live the life that we're called to live. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he tells them to kill sin too, but he says something interesting at the start. He says, by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. And that little word, by the Spirit, that little term, that is vitally important that we get it. This killing sin business, this choosing holiness business, it's not down to us and our strength alone. But what the Bible says is that the Holy Spirit lives in us. And that the Holy Spirit is there to empower us, to give us the power to live holy lives. 
There are some very powerful things in this world, but not more powerful than the Holy Spirit. It was by the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. God, through the Spirit, created the world and the universe we live in. Through His Spirit. The Holy Spirit is infinitely powerful. In fact, one of the Greek words that's, that's used to describe the Spirit's power, it's the same word that we use for dynamite. And in us lives the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who shows us our sin. We know that. But he's not only that, he's the one who gives us a hatred for sin. He's the one who gives us the desire for, to kill sin. But more than that, he gives us power to fight against sin. He strengthens us on the inside. He gives us that resolve and the power we need to say no to sin and yes to God. This morning, I, I want you to grasp this. This week, whenever you choose to make a holy choice, he will help you. He will empower you. He will strengthen you. Some of you this morning, I don't know, but my guess is that some of you this morning, you feel so defeated by your lack of holiness. And you kind of think to yourself, no, I just can't do it. I can't make progress. I can't kill my sin. I can't make the holy choice. I can't grow as a holy person. Maybe that's you this morning. Do you know, on your own you can't. You're right. You can't on your own. But you can with the help of the Holy Spirit. Why not start to pray every morning, Holy Spirit, today, as I go about my day, will you give me the power to make holy choices? Why not whenever you're in the middle of that battle with sin, say, Holy Spirit, right now, would you give me the power to resist to fight, to kill this sin. Sometimes we, we try to live the Christian life doing it all by ourselves. But that's not how it's to be. We have the Spirit's power to empower us to live holy lives. And the last thing, the last key is this. We must remember the good news. We must remember the good news. Right to the Colossians in chapter 3. In the middle of all the stuff about killing sin and all of the stuff about putting on holiness, in the middle of all of that stuff, do you notice what Paul says? He says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Listen, kill sin, put on holiness, do all of that stuff, but listen, you see in the middle of it all? Let Jesus' message dwell in you richly. Folks, we do not live holy lives to earn heaven. Jesus has earned heaven for us. We do not live holy lives to get in God's good books. We are perfectly holy in His sight because of Jesus. This morning what I want you to realize is that, that if you're striving after holiness, Kind of trying to impress God if it's all about performance to try to impress Him. Just stop that. Stop it because you'll live your life in misery because you'll never ever make it to be perfectly holy. Instead, delight in what Jesus has done. That on the journey of holiness, whenever you blow it, He's covered your sin. That on the journey of holiness, whenever you feel so unholy, He's made you holy in God's sight. Folks, there are lots of motivators to be holy people. But for me, and hopefully for you, the greatest one will be Jesus. He's made you holy in God's sight. And now he's freed you to be the person you want to be. Grace. We're saved by grace. And we must let that grace motivate us to live holy lives. This morning, none of us have arrived. In the past week, all of us have failed. But the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ covers all of our failure, all of our sin, all of our mistakes. And because of His grace, we'll be able to keep going 
making the pursuit of holiness part of our lives. Let's pray, and then we'll sing, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper together. Oh Lord God, as we sit here this morning as your people, you have given each of us a heart to be holy. We, we long to be holy. We long to be holy people who live holy lives. We long to reflect your character and your goodness and your glory and your love to our friends and family and all of those we meet. And so Lord, we ask that you would empower us and help us to live holy lives. Help us to rest firmly on the grace that Jesus has given to us. Help us to rest firmly that we are your children all because of grace. But Lord, tomorrow, whenever we wake up, help us to fight against sin, to make holy choices, and to take small steps towards being a more holy people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and remind ourselves of the power of the cross. Let's stand and say.
safe way. These are a little bit fiddly, so what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video on how to cope with them. And then as the videos go on, if you give that a go, then it just means you'll be ready to, to go for it. So if you open them, uh, after you see how to do open the top, it's, the bread's available, and then we'll take the, the other one off of the way. But just watch the video, because there is a technique to do it, so you won't spill it everywhere. give his life as a ransom for many, including us. This table is prepared for all of those who love the Lord Jesus, for all who trust in him alone as the forgiver of their sins, for those who are dedicated to living with him as the leader of their lives. This morning, all of you who love the Lord Jesus and who trust in him are invited to take of the bread and the wine. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again this morning for your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who chose the cross that we might enjoy heaven. The one who wore a crown of thorns that we may wear a crown of life. The one who was rejected by men that we could be accepted by you. The one who died for our sins according to the scriptures who was buried, who rose again, who ascended to your right hand, and who will come again to judge the living and the dead. Oh, Almighty God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. The Lord Jesus, who we can call our rescuer, our friend, our brother, our saviour, and our master. Almighty God, in the silence now, we confess our sin to you. The sin that comes into your mind. We also confess our need of Jesus and our complete reliance upon him. Father, as we come now to receive the elements of bread and wine in remembrance of Jesus, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, that in communion with Christ our Lord we may receive real encouragement and real strength until we feast with him one day in glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the command and the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On the same night, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We come to the Lord's Supper today not because we must, but because we may. Not because we are strong, but because we are weak. Not because any goodness of our own gives us a right to come, but because we need mercy today and help. We come because we love the Lord a little, and we want to love him more. 
we come because he loved us and gave himself for us. Let's take now the bread, remembering that Jesus' body was broken for you. Drink now the wine, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you.
just a couple of them are this morning. So obviously we're not going to meet the next two Sundays, but we are going to pray this Wednesday evening on Zoom. And again, if you go to the website, you'll get the details there. But I would encourage you to, to join with that prayer time. Also, the services for the next two weeks, they'll be online at 11 o'clock. And after, we're, we're going to have a Zoom coffee time just to catch up. So again, do join us for that. Also, one of the things that we do every year is we help Belfast City Mission to distribute toys. Now, because of coronavirus, um, there are no toys this year. But you can do it. Let me give you a list of things. Selection boxes, tins of sweets, boxes of biscuits, money in an envelope, gift cards, supermarket vouchers, toy store vouchers like Smith's or non-perishable groceries. And Belfast City Mission have said that you can drop those off um, to them or you can bring them to church and we'll distribute them. So we're not meeting next Sunday or the one after, but on the, the 13th of December, if you want to bring your gifts then, the Sunday that we're back, we can gather those together and we'll work our way to do it in a proven safe way, I'm sure by then, and bring those with you and we'll distribute those to, to the children in need through Belfast City Mission. Also just to say, um, a, a church in America got in touch with me who I have a connection with, and they have gave us some money to help people um, at this Christmas time in light of COVID-19. So just to put this out there to you as a church family, if you're struggling because of coronavirus, if it has made life difficult for you financially just now and you need some help at this time, please get in touch with me. Um, they will be held in the strictest of confidence, but we can help you if you're in need financially at the minute. So please do do that if you're in need. Um, but now I'm going to invite our ushers to usher you out. And uh, I'm really going to miss you. Uh, for the next few weeks, but we will see you in a couple of weeks' time. God bless you.